joining us for tonight's show. My name is Keiko Agena, and I am one of the new members of Impro Theater Main Company. Now, we recognize the immense challenges that artists and theater companies are still facing in the light of the pandemic. In our mission to spread joy, Impro has been active throughout the pandemic. In addition to our classes going online, we have presented over 350 live streamed shows for free. So I'm here, you guessed it, uh, to ask for your support in our mission. Now, when you support Impro, you are helping us to offset those costs, uh, to, to expand our programming, to strengthen our community, and to spread joy. And you're not only helping um, the performances, you're also helping the school, which is a vital, safe, welcoming place for artists of all levels and backgrounds. And we've made it very easy to make a donation. Just go to improtheater.com, click the donate button, or you can go to, uh, you can text it from your phone, text IMPRO to 44321, that's 44321, text IMPRO. And we are a nonprofit organization, so it's completely tax deductible. Well, thank you very much for listening to this pitch and for making a donation, and please enjoy the show.
Impro Theater and the cast and crew of this online performance would like to take this time to honor the indigenous peoples of the ancestral and unceded homelands we each inhabit and to consider the legacy of colonization and its far-reaching effects. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Impro Talk. I'm Mike Rock, your host for Impro Talk here at Impro Theater. Please welcome to the virtual stage our special guest for today's Impro Talk, Kelly Holden Bashar. Woo! Woo! <laughs> uh, can you hear the applause? I can. I always do in the back of my head. First, uh, we, we are recording this during the what we hope are the last days of the pandemic of the dumpster fire that was uh, the, <laughs> uh, the last day march 2021 the last days of 2020 um mm -hmm. do you realize mike that i'm getting two birthdays two pandemic birthdays i'm just gonna make it pretty are you about really that yeah you, march 27th coming up on the 27th I, how, so, nobody tells me anything i know um so I'm going to be a double pandemicer, and I'm that is pretty stoked about that. That is a sad reality, but mm -hmm. um, but ha pre happy birthday to you. Thank you. Um, so you, like so many people, have lived through the pandemic with kids. H how has that how's that been? Has it been rough stuff? Has it been okay? Was there was there a lot of homeschooling? <laughs> I see. I see you. Your eyes have gone to, wide. Yeah. My kids know how to find podcasts, I think. So I need to be real careful. Um, no, it's actually, um, it's interesting. Uh, I started off with one who went, this is kind of cool and unique and I'm doing fine. And the other one struggling. And now we've sort of flip-flopped it. Um, but um, I feel very lucky that they were older, but not, seniors or juniors or seniors last year. I mean, those are the kids I really feel bad for is anybody who is, you know, having one of those big years, like about to go into middle school or about to graduate. Sure. Um, I have a freshman and a sophomore. So, you know, my freshman's never fit, uh, stepped foot in her school. That's weird. Wow, that's so but weird. But she will probably get to experience life in school, unlike, you know, some of these poor kids who are junior and seniors it's that's who i really feel bad for and kids you know first year in college that's tough but we're 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 hanging in there we're doing okay yeah 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 thank you for Good. asking oh no oh, pleasure i uh i i'm people don't know this uh but the uh kelly's kids provided me with uh, a never-ending supply of girl scout cookies and and chocolates and other um Whatever the Girl Scouts were selling, I was buying. You were buying it, yeah, and uh, uh, much appreciated. And then you know the the crazy thing was that most of the time, <laughs> those boxes were delivered to the theater right before a show or right before rehearsal. Oh, rehearsal, and, and I didn't. Going... And I didn't bring anything home. I would rarely bring no. anything home. I'd be like, no. "All right, well, I guess that's the." <laughs> Have you seen the ingredients? I think it's for the best. Yeah, it's for the best. Yeah, there's a lot of. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, well, you know, it's it it it's it was excusable for the for the cause. Right. Um, uh, so you've been an impro theater um, stalwart for a few years now, um, but let's go back to the early times. Oh boy! Um, I think I think you were you were a musical theater kid, weren't you? In 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 the early days. Well, weirdly, uh, like early early days high school I was a, a sports kid believe it or not sure. and no, um sense. went to college thinking I would be a doctor guilty yep like my dad and my uncle and my grandfather and my older cousin um and then I realized I'd rather play a doctor than be a doctor and that uh I was quickly ratcheting up um all the requirements for a drama major so voila. Um, but at first I was terrified to sing. They kept trying to get me to audition for musicals when I was in college. 
because they're like you're built for musicals you've got the right temperament personality for musicals and i would <laughs> i get i'd get whisper voice and like i'd come in all ha ha personality and then as soon as they go okay and now sing i'd every tom dick or harry i clearly remember that song wow yeah so so um did you do plays in high school did you end up doing plays before before college or did, or were you all just jock kelly the jock i did sketches <laughs> Oh, okay. Sure. Um, I would uh, do like the class night skits. We didn't have the most robust drama program where I was. Um, now my family will tell you they knew I was going to be an actress since the time I was little because I was constantly coming up with show ideas and performing. But um, I was more class clown than class actor. Uh, and that didn't change until I sort of really, truly fell in love with theater in college. Yeah, we are very alike in that way. Was going to be a doctor, sure. was mm -hmm. on the way to being to doing that. But I was I was all into school, um, uh, like public speaking and stuff. I was the class president and all that kind of thing. And and I did one musical. I did West Side Story. And then mm -hmm. uh, and then I was like, you know what, life is, I got to get serious, I, you know, and so, so I, I did the opposite thing for you, for, from you, I did all the pre-med prerequisites in college, and then four years in, <laughs> uh, I suddenly was like, you know what, I think I'm an actor. <laughs> yeah, sorry guys. Yeah. 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 Well, people uh, say I'm the female Mike Rock, so. I haven't, I haven't heard, I haven't heard. No, that, everybody says it, Mike, know. everybody says it. That's good to know. Yeah. Uh, and, and what was your first exposure to sketch and improv stuff? Uh, well, here we go. Here yeah, we're we're going to get about. into it now. Buckle so um, in college, uh, I had never even really heard of improv. I would just make stuff up. And one of the grad students there um, paired me up with my dear friend, who's still one of my best friends uh, of college times, Rick Hammerly. And um, he's a big old actor in DC now, not old, just a big time actor. And uh, put us together and said, you guys should do improv together because we were always sort of uh, riffing off each other. And we started reading what we could about it and watching stuff. And we started doing these two person shows and making up songs and just kind of were, somewhat successful with it. And so I went to SETC's, the big uh, South um, East theater conference auditions that all the plucky college students go to. And right out of there, I booked my first job at the Renaissance Fair. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, the that was a big deal. I remember the those yeah. this, the SETC and there's a couple other ones with the similar acronym, um, yeah. for different parts, different regional for regional theater auditions. I remember that being such a big deal for such my such a big deal contemporaries. And I remember thinking like, I don't want to. I don't want. <laughs> I was so resistant to the idea of going to auditions because I was so stuck in the mud about uh, maybe being a doctor or something. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I ended up being rescued by improv. But I was always fascinated by um, people going to those auditions. And like, for, for the uninitiated, I mean, I'll let you explain. It's, you're basically in front of people that could hire you from, for any of number of different things. Um, right. And I think about it now, like literally my callback was in a hotel room. <laughs> Luckily it was very on the up and up, but <laughs> right out of college. <laughs> Wow. And uh, and uh, he's a great guy. He's the guy that ended up hiring me, Gary Izzo, who ended up starting Streetmosphere at Disney, which would be a part of my life later on. But, um, uh, you know, I was so ignorant. I didn't, I hadn't really, I hadn't read Spolin and all the books. I just thought, oh, I'm, I can make stuff up. And so I went and did this Renaissance Fair and it just happened to be one that is very theatrical. I know that sounds crazy, but the um, <laughs> Sterling Renaissance Fair, you would go for six weeks, I think, ahead of time. 
and study theater um, and history of the time, language. Uh, we would do cuttings from uh, uh, major Renaissance uh, writers. We would do sure. uh, character workshops. We would, I mean, it was, it was actor camp. And then you were, you know, your lady in waiting or mud beggar for the weekends, but the six mud weeks. Beggar. Yeah. Oh, I did that. <laughs> um, it's some of the best money ever made in my life. Um, but uh, the, the six weeks leading up to it were pretty, pretty awesome training for somebody yeah. who hadn't, you know, to do a deep dive into, into improv that's all about, it's character-based. Yeah. And it, it was also my first taste of really getting into Shakespearean language other than, you know, doing a couple plays in college. So it's kind of started my love of Shakespeare. Yeah, that's amazing that you, you honed a lot of your improv, what would be improv skills doing a thing that was sort of um, it's such a specialized place that it wasn't like in comedy clubs. It wasn't, you know, um, sink or swim in, in front of a, in front of an audience drinking beer and eating pizza or something like that, you know? Yeah. And not games wonderful... related. <clears throat> like right. I, I started with deep dive. You're in a character all day. The next big job I had was at Disney where you're in a character all day. And it wasn't until later that I learned sort of the theater sports model of we're going to play this game and we're comp competing against you. And like, that was not my beginning. So. Yeah. Um, those Renaissance fairs, man, they, man. they are, they are the origin they story of some so cool people. they yeah. really did. I mean, it is amazing. <laughs> and I remember, I confess, I remember as a young plucky improviser doing theater sports uh, and later comedy sports, I remember Ren fair being oh, frequent yeah. fodder on stage for, for jokes and, and to those whatever. of us who did it as well. <laughs> well, that's, that's comforting to know. Yeah. Uh, and you uh, eventually uh, was, was, where was the Ren Fair that you got hired for? Was that in Florida? No, that was in upstate New York, Sterling oh, okay. Renaissance Fair in upstate New York. Then I did the Texas Renaissance Fair, mm. very different vibe. Was it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Tell me some, tell me, uh, tell me some things. That's where I first be became a mud beggar, where we would do theater in the ground. And we did uh, Dante's Inferno in a mud pit. And we did Muck Beth. And. Oh. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yep. And they were pretty funny little shows that had yeah. a mud element to it. But, you know, then the rest of my day was, hey, beggar. I'll pay you five dollars to touch touch that lady over there, and then she'd go, "Oh, I'll pay you five dollars not to." And then we, you know, just make up stupid poems and oh my gosh, ridiculous money, being covered in mud and being clever. So mud beggar me literally meant that literally you'd be we all would dirty. beg. We were and characters of the, we were the beggars of the town. Yeah, and people would like ask you to do tricks and favors and pranks on other guests at the mm -hmm, Ren Fair. Mm -hmm. And then you could turn it around. It was sort of like a game show. Like you could turn it around and have them pay you to well, We did our shows, which were written right. and all that. But then in between, we were hustling, like really, you know, uh, I, I will tell you a love poem for five, five pound. Yeah. <laughs> I just sounded um, like a terrible Spinal Tap character. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it was sort of a Spinal Tap Dickens Ren Fair. Yeah, it was. Mashup. So. Yeah. F f uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think I've ever been to a proper Ren Fair. I mean, I went to mm. medieval times once, which is just oh, that a is not a Ren show. Fair. Um, so until you uh, are making out with someone in chain mail at the pub, saying you have not been to a Ren Fair. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it does sound for actors uh, and and people who just want to kind of um, be extroverted. It it does sound like a kind of amazing training because you're literally face to face with your. I mean, you're in you're w walking around with the audience all day. Yeah, um, that particular no... fair. Now other fairs are much more variety acts and and all that, but Sterling was kind of 
<laughs> in the circuit, it was the actors fair because oh, okay. it was okay. all actors and not a ton of variety acts. So there's like, like a continuum. There's a continuum among Ren fairs of which ones are a little bit more um, actory and which ones are mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. get it. Um, well, that sounds like great training. What, wh how did you end up in Orlando? So Gary Izzo, who hired me to do this fair, uh, I was, um, so I did the fair for a couple of years and then I went to Chicago to be a proper actress and um, did some shows there and uh, started to do some musicals there, did Shakespeare there, um, worked with a, a great theater uh, called Bailiwick and um, did second, that's where I took my first Second City class with Marty DeMont, who was amazing and um, really kind of started to process, oh, this is the stuff I've been sort of doing without knowing what I was doing. So I'm standing uh, on an L platform in Chicago. It's so cold that my eyes are watering and then the tears are freezing to my face. Welcome to the Midwest. Yeah, and um, that day uh, I got a phone call from Gary Izzo saying, hey, do you wanna come to Florida? just for like a year, whatever, and um, do this new thing I'm, I'm doing in uh, Disney World called Streetmosphere at MGM Studios. And it's sort of like the fair. You're gonna be a character all day and you're part of uh, Hollywood. It's 1940s glamorous Hollywood. And after uh, uncracking my face, I went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be tough. It'd be tough to be on the elevated train platform uh, uh, with uh, your face frozen and then later the same day, get a call from somebody offering you a job in Florida. Yeah. Um, yeah. Holy smokes. I bet you yeah. thought about that for 15 seconds before saying yes. Yeah. Where I was in my life. I mean, uh, and then I stayed in Florida for a long time. And now I think about living in Florida and I go, huh. I love the people of that. I, the community that I still have in Florida, but um, yeah, that was quite a head snap to go from Chicago to Florida, but I went there and did Streetmosphere where I was the girl off the bus, Maisie Shucks, and um, also Love it, an Maisie overgrown Shucks. child star. You guys think about was Maisie, basically... Maisie Shucks. Uh -huh. Everybody, yep. I'm going to give everybody a second to Google that real quick. All right, sorry. And then you were... You can see the cleverness there. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I was always trying to make it big. And, and then I also played a, a child star who was obviously not really a child anymore, but refused to <laughs> stop. Oh my God, Re refused to concede <laughs> yeah. growing up. So I was like a full, you know, woman in this red dress thing that was way too tight in certain places and big bows and it was very, you know. So it was, it was Betty Davis. Of, yeah, I was basically Betty Davis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and from there, uh, I, I uh, got tapped to do Comedy Warehouse, which I call my improv grad school. Yeah. And that it, 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 Comedy Warehouse is in, is part of SAC Theater Lab? Is, am I, do I have that right? No. Or are they, they're not no, connected. that's how I met the SAC people and, and then oh, okay. I would go right. and they're guest with them. But sure. Comedy Warehouse was Disney's uh, so Disney had this um, adult entertainment complex called Pleasure Island. Good guy. And yeah, and it was awesome. Uh, now this is the 90s. So there was mannequins, the dance club. There was eight tracks, the 80s dance club, um, all these restaurants and bars. There was the Adventurers Club, which was sort of a 1940s era um, uh, and those people would stay in character all day and it was a club for adventurers. So you'd have the dashing adventure and the maid and the, the, the president of the club and they would do these shows and sort of improvise one-on-one -on -one with people coming into their club. Comedy Warehouse did five shows a night, seven nights a week, improv. Yeah. And Love there it. you had to sing, you had to host, you had to do long form, you had to do short form. Um, you had to interact a lot with the audience. Um, you had to kind of learn how to do everything. And it's there where I first started to do a lot of musical improv. Yeah. And was that, was that a good job? Like, I mean, it was great oh training. God. 
What's it? So picture, if you will, <laughs> making a living, having amazing health benefits, buying house, buying cars, by just doing improv shows. Yeah. We'd show up at six o'clock at night, do your three or four shows. And I mean, we were vampires. You'd get home at two or three in the morning, but um, it was a, it, it was an amazing gig. And those people are my family like that. We, yeah. we went through a lot together because I did it for seven years. Holy seven, I, it takes me a long time. That was my seven yeah. years of grad school. But I mean, you have to hand, the great thing too, Mike, that I loved about that experience is we had to work clean and clever because it's Disney, you know, you, so if the audience led us to double entendres, um, you know, that was fine, but you, you couldn't just be shocking for shocking sake to get the audience, you know, um, excited about the show. You had to really appeal to a large swath of, of people. So I feel like it, it made the the folks who went through there really in tune with what, uh, with one, how audiences are responding and also just working at the top of your intelligence. Absolutely. Now, people who know me now would not say that. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are people like shaking well, Back in the heads. day, guys, right I used now. to come off real smart. <laughs> Uh, we, I benefited from that in Madison. We, you know, we didn't do nearly that many performances, but we eventually, uh, uh, we were up to, I think, seven shows in our space a week, plus private shows and college shows and that sort of thing. And it was theater sports, which then eventually became comedy sports due to a, a weird fracturing in the space time yeah. continuum. Um, but, but, but being clean and we were criticized in Madison for not swearing on stage. You know, why don't you guys swear and all that sort of thing. Um, but the upside was, I mean, first of all, it was my hometown. So the upside for me was that like the nuns that taught me in grade school and high school got to see me as an adult doing comedy on yeah. stage, you know, like, so that was kind yeah. of, this, and there were other, there were other great things about, about uh, starting in my improv career in, in my in my hometown that way. Have you ever been given an opportunity or had an opportunity to do shows back home, back in Virginia? Uh, no, I've not had that sort of hometown hero feeling. Um, in fact, I used to joke that every time my parents would come to see me in a show, it would always be somebody else's best show. You know how that just happens where like somebody, my my dad, who I would always be, he's the guy I want to impress, you know? Sure. And uh, every time he'd come to the comedy warehouse, he would leave going, oh, honey, that was really great. Man, that's Steve Pernick. He is funny. <laughs> Pernick! <laughs> Shout out to Steve Pernick. <laughs> Yo, Steve. Still have a Steve Pernick candle in my apartment. Even yes. Who does um, uh, yeah, they, I'm, I'm telling you that is, uh, it is so typical to like, I mean, like, as I've said this in this very show on Impro Talk before, but Steve Kieran reminded me that, um, your head is, you know, you are the worst seat in the house for criticizing your own performance. And, and when you've got family and friends in the audience at your show, um, let alone performing in maybe in your hometown or something like that, obviously you're going to be the worst critic of your yes. own. Of yeah, your own show. Of course you um, don't have the best show ever. So funny. Yeah. Um, so uh, what wh how, what was the transition from Florida to Los Angeles like? Was that a, was that an easy decision? Um, did it come quickly? Yeah, I had um, just finished um, <laughs> I was just gonna say I just finished my first marriage. <laughs> 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 you know they have a shop left, right? <laughs> wow. Um, there we are. You I do mean, know I'm the, the Liz Taylor of, of improv. I'm really trying to that's push the, that that it's moniker. The truth of it. Um, uh, he's a great guy. Sorry, once We're at a dentist friends. office, FYI. Yes. Um, oh, gorgeous out here. Not uh, not your ex, uh, Liz Taylor. Sorry. Right. So um, no, that that and. 
that had happened, but also I had been wanting to make a move. I, you know, was sort of doing the New York, Los Angeles, back to Chicago. Um, I'm ready to really, you know, pursue a different kind of acting. And, um, and I did, uh, also while I was in Florida, I get to know all the SAC theater people and play with them a lot. So I knew, um, Jonathan Mangum and Claire Sarah and Wayne Brady and Matt Young, Joel McCrary, uh, Dave Russell, Dan O'Sullivan, gonna name them all once I started. Um, so- Murderer's Row of- Yes, of, of, yes. Of brilliant improvisers. Yeah, and they had a group here in Los Angeles, ironically called House, House Full of- Full of- Of honkies. honkies. Yeah, I will say it. Um, <laughs> Self-named, so. Um, uh, and I would guest with them uh, back in Florida. So when I decided to come out here, Jonathan Mangum put me up in his home. Actually, he and Joel McCrary were living together at the time, put me up uh, for almost a month. Thank you, Jonathan Mangum. And um, uh, I started guesting with them and doing improv. And then they were so lovely about reaching out to Dan, Dan O'Connor, and um, you know other people in the improv world and going, you should play with this girl. And I also had moved out here at the same time as my dear friend Lisa Fredrickson. And um, Shout out to Lisa, Lisa Fredrickson. Yes, in fact, some people thought we were a couple because we were always seen together. Oh my gosh, you're not. <laughs> I know, shocking. It's shocking. So um, we kind of had this great way of just sort of coming into theater sports because people vouched for us and yeah. said you should play you should let these ladies come play with you so um uh so when i moved out here i kind of already had some inroads to some improvisers that is fantastic i remember i i got to guest with house full of honkies a couple of times and jonathan was one of the very few people uh, and as well as i think an agent at one point who, who looked at me and said stop being bi-coastal just move to la already you know nobody's gonna take you seriously until you until you move here yeah. um he was always thing. like just come out here just just do it yeah yeah, yeah. thank you jonathan thank you, um what, what do you think um you know so 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 we both were doing improv back before it became such a pervasive household word so to speak i don't know how else to describe it but um, what do you think a person that is, an actor or an improviser or a comedian who's just taking an improv class or just learning about improv now, is there a generational thing that you want to get across when you're teaching or is it, you know, you, you want to sort of stop short of being like, back in my day, we had to walk uphill three miles to school every day in the snow. You want to, you don't want to do that. But at the same time, is there some way that you try to convey to people um, that what they what they are seeing on stage when they see an improv show that impresses them, um, that a lot of history goes into that. How do you how do you convey what I'm trying? What I'm having such a hard time asking you to convey. You know, it's so interesting. I, when you first uh, start talking about this, I was thinking about how the very first time I saw the Comedy Warehouse show. It starts with um, somebody comes out and interviews somebody in the audience on the phone. And then they go, okay, great, thanks for talking. They hang up the phone because they have the, there's phones throughout the audience. So we don't know who's gonna pick up. It's just random person, interview them. They go backstage and within seconds, a song starts and everybody comes out of the five doors on stage singing that person's name and launches into a song about that person. Wow. And cool. from my point of view, the first time I saw that, knowing I was going to do the show, I went, that is a magic trick and I will never know how to do it. I, I just was blown away. Then you go backstage and you see the like, um, oh, okay, Dennis, I'm going to do something about fillings. Uh, okay, I'm going to work backwards from that. And you, you see people riffing off of each other and giving each other ideas and you see people working on how they're forming their rhymes and it all starts to, it's like anything. Once you start to work it or train it or see how people have figured out the process of it, you, a little bit of the magic goes away, but 
then you realize, oh, it's an actual skill that I can, I can learn and grow and get better at. Um, now, I will say when I was doing it, it, it was much more of a, of a dude's world. And um, yeah. for whatever reason, I don't know if it's because I have three brothers, um, I never really approached it that way. I, I kind of just went, I'm going to get out there and do my thing. And um, so I know that uh, just with everything that's happened in the world lately, I have really had to kind of rethink um, sort of the way this is getting a lot deeper than what I than I think no, like what you were deep. yeah what you were asking but go. um I think I sort of used to pat myself on the back for going um I I didn't let you know my my sex hold me back or I never bought into um oh you have to make room for me on stage because I would see that as like a almost like a, a weakness or something and I've really had to look at that in the last couple of years and go, um, how do you become a more generous player and, and provide opportunities and yet also let people know that the stage has to be taken as much as it has to be given. You can't just always wait for some beautiful handwritten invitation to come on. Mm -hmm. Like you've, you've, you got to create your own opportunities too. Um, and I think that's a, a, something I'm still curious about and still working on as, as a teacher and as a performer of how to, how to feel like I'm being inviting and get past my own things about like, hey man, you could have come on anytime you wanted. Yeah, that is a struggle. I, I remember back back in the in the when I was doing a hundred short form shows. Um, you know, you you really you really did have to struggle, particularly for those of us who were either sort of like a leader in in the group, or in my case, sort of you know in charge uh, of things. Um, you really had to balance the politeness of of I want to make I want to make the other performers feel like they are welcome and there's a giant wide open space and um, um, versus we're not going to sacrifice keeping the balls in the air of the show in order to make a, a performer feel super accommodated, et cetera. So yeah. it has to happen. It has to happen before everybody's on stage. <laughs> the, the, you are, you know, um, we are all the master of the destiny of the show, uh, you know, but we we also have to take care of each other. But we also have to be you know step up and it's yeah. a really it's a really um, delicate um, concept to teach and to, uh, to uh, ensemble is a really delicate um, thing to get across. That's something I've been talking about actually in the last few classes that I've been teaching is um, you know how what do we consider a win. When, when do you feel like that was a great show? And a lot of it is, um, oh, when we have no look passes and when it feels like it was seamless and it was fun and it felt like we did the genre and it, and there's a lot of answers that are about, you know, how, how you feel. And, you know, part of what I always try to get across is that's all great, but really it's a win if the audience loved it and understood it yeah. because it's it's once it starts being about you know how was that experience for me um then it, it you sort of lose sight of the fact that story is king and so it goes back to those things of like if the show needs you to come out and and then come out you don't need <laughs> an invitation yeah. from from the rest of us yeah what is what does the story need when does it uh, you know um when is it time to like push press on the gas and when is it time to to not press on the gas which brings us to um you know the concepts that we talk about at impro with patsy rotenberg's second circle um which joe mcginley brought to my attention i think she brought to everyone's attention at yeah impro. and um 
and the idea of your presence being enough, uh, provided you serve your presence, you serve yourself, you serve the story. Um, if you are shrinking, uh, and and in what Rotenberg calls first circle, if you're shrinking away, you're you're taking from the group, you're taking from the ensemble um, part of the puzzle. And if you are what Rotenberg calls third circle, and you're pushing everything out, and and there isn't a balance. You are um, over, you know, pa painting over or shouting over uh, other pieces of of the puzzle. But second circle is that is that perfect balance? Yeah, yeah. Of sharing, right? Yeah. Um, t t talk a little bit about um, the the transition. You, you made a transition with a class last year when we went to all online. Um, and, and you had, you, you, as I understand it, you had a conversation with the class about the possibility of doing an audio only um, show, which could then be obviously be um, spun off into a podcast. How, how did your audio lab um, class sort of get, get created into what we now call Sonder? Um, so as you know, Mike, because you and I have talked often about Wanting we have to, to pretend that we haven't. <laughs> uh, Mr. Rock. Um, <laughs> no, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, we, yes. you know, we've talked it. We, we've both wanted there to be a, you know, an audio component to, to improv for there to be a, a robust, um, uh, it, it's such a perfect thing for us to be doing, to be doing audio storytelling. Podcasts. Yeah. Audio storytelling. So um, when the pandemic happened, I was in the middle of uh, the the lab before Saunder uh, was creating a show. We were I was I was the little R and D weirdo I think at Impro. Um, going, what, can the, yeah. what can we create? What can we create? So we had uh, started a lab which was a genre um, creation, and um, so we were going to develop it together. We the part of the process was going. How do we as a group decide? what we want to do, what the what the genre will be, what the stories are. People came in and did pitches. We, we kind of did pitch meetings and, and then we would develop and talk about it and we voted and we finally got down to the genre we were going to do is murder ballad, <laughs> which <laughs> I am still determined to do because I think it's going to be uh, crazy and amazing. So we're going to so do for, murder for, ballad. For people who don't know, there is a tradition, uh, which I believe is uh, from Appalachia, mm -hmm. and uh, of um, incredibly morose yeah. <laughs> uh, songs about uh, people, about lovers murdering one another, that sort of thing. And, yeah. and they uh, actually come from like England, Scotland, like they, they come oh, over right, here, of course. Even, of they even predate that. But yeah, of they're, course they they're just... Appalachia. you know yeah. she did me wrong so i did drown her in the river there's lots of drownings in the river there's lots of, a, lot of, a lot of mournful banjo playing and yes. uh, uh, slightly off key violins and and uh, etc along with yeah. the dolly parton yeah. has a great podcast uh, it talks about it in her podcast about murder ballads and this is tradition nice. she grew up with so we were all really jazzed about this and how we're going to update it and how we're going to make it not you know like take the the victimizing of women, uh, you know, how we were going to deal with that, like really big concepts. And we were going to do live music. It was so exciting. Pandemic. So then we got on Zoom and went, okay, this was a really musical uh, um, genre. Zoom, early day Zooms, uh, I talk, everybody else goes away. You know, the, there's no way to do music on Zoom. And it was a, also a very physical, almost um, uh, could be dance-like at points, you know, sure. just um, a very physical, we were working a lot with um, how do we show um, theatrically a death so that we're not just really seeing somebody choke somebody, but how can we um, make it less upsetting and, and just really putting a lot of thought into that stuff, which was not going to work on Zoom. So we had 
basically a month and a half, two months left. And I said, let's just tell really great stories. And we hit upon, let's do modern day checkoff because everybody in this lab had already studied checkoff. And it's so great for being in, stuck in one place. And so we said, let's just do an updated modern, like we're all the lake house doing checkoff. And I, I don't even remember how I hit upon it. I think I was actively trying to find ways to work on our listening skills. So let's just take our cameras off and do this like a, like a radio play. And it blew my mind how dropped in everybody was. Like day one, people were really um, uh, describing where they were. They were playing with, you know, uh, let go of my arm, you know, things that would, they were painting pictures. They were really yeah. painting pictures. Yeah. And it just got me so excited about doing something um, of an improvised podcast where we cannot see each other. And so I knew before the lab that became Saunders started that I wanted to do a podcast, that I wanted to do um, really work on how we are going to paint pictures, how we're going to signal to each other. Um, we could have looked at each other and just done audio recordings. And I said, let's take our cameras out because when we take our cameras out, we just have better language because we have to take care of each other to let each other know where we are and um, how we're going to enter a scene when we can't see who's about to come into a scene. Yeah. So cut to, um, I had come up with this sort of weird idea about like, let's make it the memory bank where you can go <laughs> and check out people's memories. So the stories can be different each week. And I knew I didn't want I it to that. be anything that had to do with the world we were currently in. So it was like, how do we find a world we want to play in that doesn't feel anything like 2020? Um, and we played with, we looked at Ray Bradbury, we looked at sci-fi, we did all these different kinds of things. And finally, sort of all at the same time, Susan Deming, who was in the class, brought up the concept of Sonder, which is the realization that, um, you know, people on the periphery of your life are, are living completely full, realized lives of their own. So it's that thing of, oh, another person's perspective. That's, that's interesting. And then someone said, what if we took as a suggestion things you used to believe as a child? And from there, we hit upon the concept of normalizing the abnormal. So those sort of became the tent poles for us of the kind of show we wanted to do. And from that, we came up with Sonder, which has Fantastic. been a super fun podcast to work on. And, and the, the first season of the podcast is out into the world. Um, and the second season, it, the live shows are happening right now. Right now, yes. Including a very special show this month, Sister Sonder. That's right, March 20th at 7 p.m. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna jump in on that one. Ooh. Nice, and that, yeah. that's an all, a cast of all women. Yes. Um, and you had also, I mean, just to be clear, I mean, Impro uh, through, again, through Joe McGinley had, had for years been doing um, Improvised Twilight Zone, yes. which then it became for us um, our streaming show, The Portal. And you had done, because I, I know because I had subbed in a few times um, uh, with a class, a Blank Mirror, which had been uh, sort of a, a dovetailing off of Black Mirror. Yep. Um, so you were no, um, oh, the pun is coming up, but you were no stranger oh. to, to that's an inside joke, y'all, no. <laughs> uh, to, uh, to doing a, a you know, slightly abnormal kind of a world that Sonder is. I guess it's I really great, do like alternate realities, I'm realizing. Which is fantastic. I'm, I mean, yeah. But this this audio version is such a great blending of the of sort of like taking the best elements of all those different things. Um, yeah. And and then the podcast, of course, is gently massaged in post production um, by Ted Cannon with music. Who's and amazing. Yeah. Sound effects. Yeah. Having and, an improviser do the the, the editing is just because he's he's picturing things and enhancing things. Uh, in such an incredible way. Um, yeah, he's just done a terrific job with it. Yeah, which is, uh, which is lovely. And there yeah. are Sonder drinks. Yes. 
So we we were like, when we decided to do a launch party, I went, I, I want us to have a signature cocktail. And Gail Brennan uh, was a bartender. And um, so she came up with some different ones for the launch party. And we just fell so in love with the idea. And Gail's so good at it that we went, let's, let's release a drink with every single episode. And you know, make it feel like a party. So yeah, it's, it's pretty great. You're creating yeah. your own cult. Yes, I uh, hope so. The cult of Sonder. Yeah. <laughs> I've always wanted to be a cult leader, as you well know. I think the social media handles are improvised podcast. Um, they're, they're two, they're two slightly different, but, um, but yeah. you'll find if you, if you Google Sonder, S-O-N-D-E-R, um, and podcast or, uh, that Sonder, the improvised podcast. And then we're, um, on Instagram, I think as, uh, improv, underscore podcast um and i think it's the same on twitter yeah yeah um you did an uh what i think is an off-broadway show with um with the one and only brian loman uh reader one of Rudner my many and, fake husbands yes brian <laughs> loman uh brian uh brian and kelly as brian and kelly uh velour in the holiday shows are legendary at impro um Robert Yakko, uh, Rita Rudner, and the two of you did yeah. uh, Two's a Crowd. The four mm -hmm. of you, excuse me, the four of you yes. did Two's a Crowd. How did that, how was that? How did that come about? And, and uh, so I got to live in New York for a minute. And early 2000s, uh, I think it was Brian who originally was contacted by Martin, Rita's husband, um, by the way, they are the loveliest people ever, um, to do a show in Las Vegas called Boo, which was written, but then um, also needed some moments in between that would be improvised. So it ended up being me, Dan, Edie, and Brian Lohman living in Vegas for uh, almost a year. And it was insane and the stories like from Lisa, that era. yeah oh there's stories believe me <laughs> oh tequila Sorry, night bro. but yeah so um so the four of us did it and then lisa also came in and did some shows ryan smith you know there's a lot of impro people around this floyd so then uh Martin had an idea for a movie. So he put all of us in this movie called Thanks. It's all gathered around, it's all set around Thanksgiving um, over the um, 2008, 2009, 2010, I believe, but it's the financial crisis and how it affects this family. And we've just had this great relationship with, with them since then. So they put Brian and I in the show when they did it at Laguna Playhouse uh, Rita and her husband wrote it, wrote the play. They've written a ton of plays and they put, um, they put Brian and I in the show. And then we had a chance to do it off Broadway in New York and they brought us out there with them. It was incredible. So Brian and I got to pretend we were New York, uh, for realsy New York actors for an entire well, summer. you were it was I mean, magical. Were. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we were. <laughs> I shouldn't say pretend. Yeah, <laughs> so we had an apartment on the Upper East Side, and you know, would walk to walk to our theater job at night, and missed our That's families great. incredibly, but had a great experience. Just a great experience, and it kind of made me go, "Oh yeah, why aren't we auditioning for plays?" Yeah, in L.A. and then pandemic. <laughs> 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 the pandemic trombone happened. Uh, wah, wah. Uh, is there a is there a um, alt universe you who is not acting, teaching, directing uh, out there on Bizarro Planet? What and what is she doing? She <laughs> might be in politics. Mm. Or um, maybe working with some sort of um, women or children's group. I'm mm -hmm. finding, especially as I get older, that a lot of my passion is going in that direction. Um, I think uh, the only reason I say politics is I think that I'm, um, I think I'm 
fairly good at relationship building. And I think that's the part that interests me about politics and, and how you can put people together to get something done. Um, but uh, my, I think my real passion would be some sort of work with, with women and children's rights or causes or probably because I have two girls. Yeah, I grew up in a house of boys, but the universe knew what I needed and gave me two daughters. And it's yeah. really just opened my eyes to just so many pressures and things that I, I would love to be an active part of changing. If you get elected to the right office, you serve both of those things. You, you, you get to make, uh, help make changes that affect so many lives. So is it going to be right. school board first, city council representative, or are you just going to jump right to Senator, mayor? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I still want to play it on TV. That's my Not thing. I, I, I can't get, I can't quit it, you know? I can't, I can't quit this for whatever reason. Um, what are, Still love it. what are three things that, uh, everyone must have if they're going on a trip with you? Like so that you're, maybe you're hosting the trip or you're, um, driving or something like that. What, what are three things that uh, everybody has to. Mm, well, bring? because driving's involved, I probably shouldn't say wine. Um, <laughs> chocolate chocolate sure yeah um uh a a wide range of music because i like a wide range of music and um uh good stories do you have I love hear good stories do you have uh do you ever play that those those there's those various card games and ripoff versions of the same card games where it's sort of like the the really daring questions, the really provocative questions. Do you play those, those things, or do you just do those live with in with uh, <laughs> casts in the green room like we do? Yeah, I love those kind of games. Um, anything where you get to know somebody better, yeah. you know, or you get to hear a story about somebody, or you get to hear their take on it. It's you know, it's probably why Truth or Dare is so popular. But <laughs> um, even things like cards against humanity it's kind of sure. just to see how people's brains work um did you ever reveal something like you know that you know the um that old there's an old uh, sort of warm-up exercise where you sit in a circle and uh there's i think there's one fewer chairs than there are people and someone's it and you the person in the middle who is it says um uh, the, a strong wind blows for anyone who has never you know, made Is this out never have I ever. Yes. Never have I ever. Right. Yeah. Right. Same thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you said in one of those that, that j it just came out of your mouth and you're like, I can't believe I just, um, revealed that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Not anything that you're going to say now. I get it. I had, I did one of those things in a, in a class <laughs> once and had a guy come up to me afterwards and like, like I was the, you know, the, teacher and he was mm -hmm. really mad he was really mad that i had that i had um proctored an exercise where people were asked to reveal things and i was like dude you didn't have to tell right yeah i don't think i've played something like that in a class setting but in a like friends having a, a drink or two and then sure. busting out with saying that thing that you're like oh wow i really just let everybody know about that <laughs> yes, I've had that moment. Uh, what 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 is something that happens in a show or um, or in a class when you're the director or or um, leading it that gives you like a booster shot of this is why I do this? Is there can you think of a either a specific example or my, a more general like oh man when that happens that's the that's the stuff. Um, oh man, I don't know if I can put it to words, but the thing that I've experienced as an actor where you just feel like, oh, this show is kind of happening 
you know, it's like when Lisa Fredrickson talks about the improv fairies, you know, it Absolutely. just feels like it's all magical and it's happening. And, and, you know, I talk about the, the no look pass with certain people that you play with a lot that you just know, I just know what they're going to do. And not in that, like, Oh, I know what you're going to do. You always do that. <laughs> it, but in that, um, like, Oh, I know if I lob this to you this way, you're going to hit it back and it's going to be so awesome. When that happens, and I can tell it's happening for my students because you can just feel the energy and the momentum of the show. It's, it's, yeah, it's like proud mom moment. I mean, it just feels amazing. And, or when somebody who you've given, you know, a specific uh, note to uh, about, you know, trusting to, that they can be brave or that they can try something new. And then you see the attempt and then you see their excitement at the attempt. I mean, that's, that's um, a huge part of it. And just p humans coming together and telling a great story that they and the audience um, at the end of it go, I'm so glad I was here for that. That that's, um, you know, that hits me in like a, a like a primal place. Absolutely. I think it's better than moments like that, particularly when they happen in class or when they happen in a show where you know students are in the audience. Um, it's better than hours of trying to explain something or trying to, uh, you know, dissect something. Um, yeah, who wants to do that? Oh my gosh, it's just <laughs> tiresome. But, but when, when it happens and everyone witnesses it, you can, you just kind of stand there and, and, and in, sort of in awe, in glee, in joy, the, the brain chemicals, the, the, uh, all the endorphins are flowing and it just feels like, yes, that is it. That's the thing, that's the yeah. lightning. And you um, don't see it coming. It's not like, like I've had students come up to me or, or just audience members go, oh my God, that moment when you and then Mike did this or that. And it's not like you went, yep, and I saw it coming. I saw it coming three, it, it's as surprising and delightful to you as it is to the audience. And I think that's when it really registers how authentic and how magical this art form is, is that we all experienced it at the same time. If we're not pre-planning and we're not um, being, you know, calculating in our approach. Uh, yeah, we sort of, I think at a certain level of this, you do start to see a little bit of the chess game of it in terms of where the story could go. You know, if I make this move, we might go this way for those moments where somebody says something and it triggers something in you that, and, and out comes this perfect thing for your character to say that also has a double meaning or um, is just that, that just right thing. It's, it's magical for everybody. So that's what makes it such an incredible moment um, for the audience is, is they know you're, you're just as like, I didn't know that was going to come out of my mouth either, or I didn't know that was going to happen either. And the trick, I think part of the magic trick, and I say this because I recently watched a Jane Austen that you and I were both in from the Broad stage. Part of the magic trick is not revealing <laughs> how surprised you are at the, yes. that, that that thing happened. Yes. And if you, if you don't reveal it, then after the show, people will say, how did you know that that person was going to do that, et cetera? And you're like, I didn't. And they're like, yeah, but it looked so, you know, pre-planned. You didn't like, well, seem that's... surprised. That's the acting part. Yeah. That's the acting part. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you think, um, I know we're all, we all, those of us who work together pretty regularly are, are all champing at the bit for getting back on li live stages. Um, forgive me if this sounds either simplistic or or kind of duh or something but do you think we've learned something as creators and as actors and improvisers from having to be online and when we get back live we will have brought lessons and 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 growth or do you think we've it's been a year of compromise and now we get back to the real thing what's your where are you on that continuum the word that popped into my head when you said that is resilience. I think we've learned resilience. You know, we will find a way. I think art is like nature. It it finds a way. It's gonna it's gonna get done one way or another. 
And I've learned a lot. I mean, for me, the experience of, of um, audio plays has been huge because I wanna take that scene painting skill, that listening skill, that, um, that uh, really fine tuning my, my hearing skill into my onstage work. So that's a very specific thing that I've learned from all this. Um, I've learned a lot more about my own tech setup, which I think is great. And now I understand um, technicians that I work with better and, and yeah. what they're dealing with. And I, I'm getting more of an ear for like, oh, music should be coming in now. You know, things that I haven't had to do as much. So there's really specific things I've learned, but the biggest overall thing is just that nothing will stop it. Nothing will stop it. Yeah. I love it. Um, we didn't even get to talk about Fellowship the Musical. Um, oh, but, look up Fellowship the Musical. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Kelly Holden Bashar. Um, thank you so much, Kelly. Oh, thank you. This was fun. Do you, do you have any? Do you have any um, final thoughts you want to remind anybody about apart from uh, watch for Sonder and um, and other shows? Um, yeah, uh, please give Sonder a listen. Please uh, support the arts when they come back. They're going to desperately need it. And um, just keep telling great kick-ass stories. Thank you for joining us for Impro Talk. Thank you, Kelly Holden Bashar. Thank you, for Mike Rock. Being a lovely guest. Christian, our tech, Val Coons, our chat moderator. And uh, if you're listening to this in the future, oh man, I, I'm jealous of our future selves where. We are oh, post pandemic. <laughs> I'm sure it's going great. I hope it is. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Bye, everybody.